And then uh, before we post it up to YouTube, we uh, clip out the space before and after, oh, okay. and then post it to so YouTube. So when I'm done, then just uh, your you don't stuff. worry about it. We'll get one of the oh, one of the okay. so don't worry staff about people it. to come through don't and. X out of it or yeah. Okay, um, looks good. Let's go. Oh, it was last week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah but the music industry is very interesting business. Oh, I know it well. What would you like yeah. Because, yeah, it is just so um, rigged as an industry. It's very weird. Well, like Taylor Swift is charging two hundred and fifty dollars a ticket. Well, actually, more than that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because a lot of the tickets that are actually for people actually showing up, they go through a lot of scalpers and things like that. And some of the scalpers are actually agents. Yeah, like Taylor Swift's concerts will all go for a thousand a ticket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Yeah, it's also a whole other stream. Well, it turns out the scalpers are actually working for Taylor Swift, so there's a lot of or the agents. No, really. There, there's a company called Live Nation. Yeah. And Those guys are even they worse. Sell, they sell the tickets. And they send scalpers from homeless shelters to go buy the tickets. Oh, wow. And That's what they do in China. Now they've got a sweet deal. It's like every American Express person got to buy Taylor Swift tickets. The only thing that's available is the voting sections when they go on sale on the Oh, so all the good tickets are American Express? Yep. Mm -hmm. And those are the people who are going to sell them for a thousand who are limited to four. Oh, gee, I should have known that. I could give them gifts. Yeah. <laughs> Only $250. Mm -hmm. right. Is that for any American Express or is it like Platinum or? No, any American Express. They were given a special code and they, they went on sale at 10 o'clock last Monday. Oh. And they were sold off by me. Nationwide. Seriously? That within two hours? Yeah. I don't even think her concert, her red concert, sold out in a half hour. Nationwide. I was and thinking her, that, or sorry. I was thinking is that actual people, or is that like Ticketmaster buying half the tickets and then it's called sold out? And scalpers and so on? Yeah. yeah. Well, Ticketmaster and Live Nation are. Two separate companies. No. They're both. Well, they're, they're, well, they're technically the same thing, but they're like two different companies. Yes. Yeah. Sort of like Musicians, Friends, and Guitar Center. Mm -hmm. Well, the access, what is it, those, those fees that they add on is kind of outrageous, too. Well, that's what I'm figuring in because the lower switch tickets are really only 214. Yeah, I want to know about the music industry market. Well, that's, that's an industry just waiting to get the. Uh, and that's why I'm here. I want to find out how easy is Elliot to paint. Zero time. It's a power of PR story. <laughs> and it is. <laughs> Not this type of PR, but it kind of is, yeah. Well, they, you know, this is hard. There's the whole media conglomerate thing too, you know, you have one thing going on and then you have books and TV interviews, or, so it's all, <laughs> you know, what is it, it's like that company that in Beverly Hills that does all the creative art, yeah, creative artists that you can see, that's what it's called, yeah, CAA, CAA, CAA. Yeah. yeah, the Eagles are on it and everybody, yeah, Bernie <laughs> Maslow owns it. But it's not just the agents anymore, it's like all of the, you know, you would have a book deal going with the recording deal, and then, all, and then they basically encompass all your stuff, so that they just milk that. Closed perfume unit. Yeah. Oh, close the bit. Yeah. I mean, a lot of just came out with the perfume. Who's the guy who took it? Jimmy Fallon. He used to play. Okay. Yeah. Well, a lot of sports people. Ready. Ready. Yeah. Ready. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, you guys are, are ready to start. All right, so this is just a, a crash course in PR. My name is Sarah Broom. I work for Ubiquity PR, and we work exclusively, for the most part, I should say, with high growth B2B tech startups. So that's our sweet spot. I've been with them for about a year. Before that, I was with another local agency in Phoenix, and we did PR from everything from a personal stylist to a mortgage company. So I have worked for two years kind of in whatever industry we could find and then really found a love of tech and moved into that area. So I'm here just to kind of go over what you can learn from PR. And, and there's this misnomer about PR that 
you need publicists to be out there for you. And there's a, certainly a reason why big companies use PR professionals, but as entrepreneurs and small business owners, the media absolutely wants to hear from you personally. And there's a lot you can do as a business owner to help get your name out there. And I'll certainly, if you guys have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to ask. Um, want to make this as helpful to you guys as possible. Part, 
you want to do PR when you have a clear message that you developed. You want to know what your product is. You want to know how you're going to sell it to the media. Because remember, you lose a element of, of control when you put your message out there to the media. So if there's holes in your product, if you don't have customers, if you don't have a clear message and a clear product you can put across, the media is likely going to find those holes. If they write an article, people are going to find those holes and comment on it. So you want to make sure that you have a clear picture that you're ready to bring out there. So signs you're ready for PR is that you have a target market, you have a brand identity, you have a message that you know that you want to get across. You have a viable product, you have beta users that have tested, you have customers that can talk about your product. You're potentially more than just you. Sometimes this isn't true if you're a consultant or some kind of solo entrepreneur. But for the most part, if you're building a tech company, you probably have more than one person on your staff. And also you recognize that PR is a building block. If you expect to win your first round of pitches to the media that you're gonna be in Fast Company and the New York Times, then you're not really understanding how PR works. PR is a foundation. It's something, unlike advertising, for example, when you start small and you build, like we find with some of our clients, it takes a long time to build, but this, as soon as we can start getting them in bigger publications, then media sources start, start turning to us, and, this sh and there's a shift in how we deal with media and how we deal with clients. And you're not afraid to think out of the box is a big one. Think about what types of articles that you like to read. You don't want to hear the same person saying the same thing that you've heard a million times. So if you really want to get your message out there, you're going to have to say something different or unique. So think about what you're reading. How could you insert yourself into that conversation in a way that's interesting? It's something that you would want to read. What do you think about when you read a publication? You're like, why aren't they saying this? That's the type of message that you should be thinking about how you can get yourself into that conversation. Next slide. So one last gut check. And this is something I think it can be a personal writing exercise. It should be something that you really sit down. And this is what we do for all of our clients. Um, so it's something that you can do for yourself. Is to sit down there and think, who are my target customers? What are the key messages that if I was going to have an article placed, I would like to be seen? I would like to see an article. Who are my competitors? And how am I different from my competitors? And do I know the difference between PR and marketing? What specifically am I trying to achieve with PR? And what are the goals, strategic and um, really obtainable goals for PR that you can try to target? So think about these things before you move into a PR program. So what is the difference between PR and marketing? I think of PR as being, it's a good question. <laughs> it's really that, I think of marketing as more your website, your advertising, your, you know, what is the content on your website, what are those type of messages, and then PR would be that news element, like if you have a product launch, then you take that out to the media, it's not what's going to, it's not the same type of message that's on your website, it's not the same type of message that's in your advertising campaigns, it's a unique thing in and of itself. Next slide. So there's a couple components of media of PR and the biggest one is media relations which I think of as standard PR if I say I work in PR this is typically what people think about which is press releases and trying to generate interviews with the media which results in the reporter writing an article on your behalf as well as um, analyst relations would fit in this typically as well so this is still standard and of course for big news announcements, it's still very common. But I will say that as we move across, thought leadership has become more and more important. So that's something to keep in mind, that it's not always traditional media relations. If a reporter doesn't want to interview you, there's other ways that you can communicate with that person. And also with press releases, I still think there is a benefit of putting something over the newswire that's still very common. But it's not, big, not the same benefit that it used to. It used to be that reporters would run a story, they'd contact you through press releases. We see that very little anymore. The real value in a press release is for SEO value, it's for getting your name in Google search results. So if that's the goal, then that's, that's a good nomer. But when people post a press release on their website, that really has no similar equivalent to an, as an article in terms of having your name on the website. Next. 
So influencers are something that we also see as the media landscape has changed, this is huge. So now we might see people who are huge on Twitter who talk about your space, but they're not necessarily a reporter churning out articles for the New York Times. But influencers are a great way to get people important in your space talking about your product. And it's important to strategize unique ways that you can engage with these people. And this might be following them on Twitter, trying to comment on their blog post, retweeting them, and having a strategic plan of how do you get your product in front of these people, and then how might you get them to actually tweet your, about your product, write a blog post about your product. And now anyone can write a blog, but there's some huge blogs that have a true industry following that can be incredibly important. So influencers have become a really important part of the media relations space. And so thought leadership, I've talked about several times, and as I mentioned, almost every news publication has some type of thought leadership articles that they post. So this is an area too, and a lot of sources actually have, VentureBeat, for example, has just an online form where you submit content. So you can draft a full article, having an interesting and unique point of view on your space, and there's several sites allbusiness.com, VentureBeat, that you can just submit your full article and see if they'll run it. And you can contact and, and say rather you have an idea for a story or here's a full story. And there's tons of work. I think that's one of the easiest ways to get your name out there as an entrepreneur and a business owner is trying to look who takes thought leadership content, who can I connect with, and then trying to submit an article and find that. And it's something that we encourage everyone to do, and it's just become huge in this space, and even down to our local business journal you know, has contributed content. It's a great way to get your name out there. So how to pitch the media. Now, uh, as I said in the beginning, there's this misnomer when I talk to entrepreneurs and business owners that media doesn't want to hear from business owners. They only want to hear from PR professionals, which is absolutely not true. And in fact, a lot of reporters really prefer to hear from the business professionals themselves. They love it when someone reaches out to them and wants to tell their story. So when you're contacting the media, want for, first for finding contact information. We pay as PR professionals a lot of money for expensive databases for contact information, but there's a lot of contact information that can be found online. A lot of, especially industry publications, will post a reporter's email address right on the article, which makes them easy to contact. You can also, I mean, personally myself, I've just called information asking to connect for a publication and, and you can just ask an operator to talk to a reporter and they'll typically connect you right to that person. So I often recommend just calling the publication. My thing with reporters and, and what I tell everyone that I talk to is don't be afraid to try to connect with them. Tweet them, message them on LinkedIn. If you have their email address, like within reason, don't be harassing them, but reporters are very busy. They get tons of emails a day. Don't be afraid to follow up. Don't be afraid to email them. Don't be afraid to send them a tweet. If you have a story you think they want to hear, try your best to get in front of them. But understand that the media is writing news. They don't want to write an ab uh, advertising piece saying what a great company this is. Mm -hmm. So what makes your company unique? What is the news element? What are you doing differently? Think about the type of story that they would write and try to write your pitch or focus your conversation on that. If so, if you're trying to sell too hard, you're going to lose the reporter's interest. And think of thought leadership as well. Try to say, are you, you know, and if you're doing thought leadership, then you don't want to focus on your business. You want to focus on who you are and why your voice is important in this space versus your company's. The fact that you have a company is important, but your unique position in the industry as an individual is what you want to be selling if you're focusing on the leadership. So talking to the media. This is basically a very short media training. The biggest thing for our talking to the media is understand that nothing is off the record. Anything that you say can be used in an article. Some reporters are much nicer than others, so if you say that, some may you know not use something, but you have to be careful what you say to reporters. And don't let any reporter catch you off guard. If someone calls you and they want to talk right then, it's perfectly acceptable to say, well, let me call you back, can we pick a time? Never let yourself be thrown off guard because you really want the interview. The reporter should respect your time as much as you respect theirs. 
And so never discuss any, anything that's on background information, anything that you don't want to be published in an article, don't say in an interview. Never ask to review an article, never ask when they're planning to run the article. You can do these stuff within reasons, but these are typically major pet peeves to reporters. That they might ask you to review specific financial information or very specific technical jargon, but for the most part, reporters will not let you see a copy of the article beforehand. They don't want to give you a date because often things like breaking news or their <coughs> editor can influence this, and so it's often not consistent. And that usually has, a lot of it is not really in the reporter's control. And so, but here, and never, if there's, we always say with articles, if there's something factually incorrect in the article, if they spelled someone's name wrong, if they listed your starting date wrong, absolutely reach out and say, this was incorrect, can you fix it? But if you're uncomfortable with the tone of something, if you wish they'd phrased it differently, that's just a part of the PR message. And we would, we would say never reach out to a reporter and ask them to change something unless it is factually incorrect. Next slide. So speaking of awards, We'll just go into a little on this, which is just that speaking in awards can be a great part to really build PR for your business, to validate your company, and to put yourself out there in terms of a speaker. Speaking opportunities have become much, much harder to get if they're not local opportunities. We used to submit and have a very good success rate in my company for conferences, but lately conferences are becoming smaller, tighter budget, and most of them are tied to sponsorship. So I think it's great to start locally, it's great to submit yourself, it's usually a very easy process, but understand that speaking has become harder and harder to come by, and it's often tied to sponsorship. And for awards, I think awards are a great way to validate your company. They're easy submission process, and also you can think, what is your goal with an award? So for example, if you want to recruit for your company, a best places to work award. If, you know, if your goal is to highlight your technology, then you might want a technology-based award. So social media. Social media is a really important component, and I think there's two aspects of social media. I think there's social media on the marketing side, which is that you really need to have awareness for your brand, have a page where you're engaging, and then I also think there's a social media aspect where you personally can engage with reporters, can engage with influencers, can try to get people to write stories and, and really build your presence. And I think having a page as an individual who is a thought leader in the space and connecting with influencers is a great way to use social media as a separate component from your business. Your business page should be more about marketing and your personal page should be more about engaging and saying interesting things in the space that get people interested. So that's an, my vision of how social media is used in a PR component, and it's not necessarily coming from a business's page. Uh, one question on the previous mm -hmm. slide. This, I, don't, I don't see uh, LinkedIn. Is, do you see any activity on LinkedIn for PR? Oh, absolutely. And I think LinkedIn is really important. You can have for a company, but also for an individual. I think LinkedIn can be a great place to outreach to reporters. LinkedIn is a great place to post your blog posts and articles. They're making it really easy to publish your own content. And if you have a blog, you can easily repurpose that on LinkedIn. So I do think LinkedIn is a great place. I mean, again, it's separate. You have your company page in which you want to do yeah. more of advertising marketing. Right. And then as a professional thought leader, I think the LinkedIn page is also great to outreach and post original and unique content. So this is owned content, which is something that is usually mostly for bigger companies. Um, and also, um, for example, one of our um, account directors at Ubiquity used to work for Kaspersky, and they developed Threat Post, which was their own unique blog. And they developed that to a point where it became its own news source. And there's also owned content in the sense of webinars, white papers, blog posts. So those can live on your website. And then they have the ability, when they grow, to really become their own sources of news. So Firehost, for example, which is one of our clients, we do a webinar series for them. And the webinar series we use in our, to support our PR efforts, and it's become an important component of that, and it's actually become one of the biggest 
lead generation tools for the company that we do on the content side. Okay, so if you're interested in public relations, here's kind of some of the things that you can start with. First would be defining what are your PR goals. And I think goals are a really important aspect of PR. And there's something that people think that PR isn't measurable. You can't have a specific ROI because there's so many other factors at play. There's breaking news, there's reporters, there's a million things that can get in the way. And that's absolutely true. But as with anything, you should have clear goals in mind because they help drive your program, they help clarify what you're trying to do. So have a clear goal and you know start small. I think you can start with thought leadership, you can start with your local media, and you can start with very targeted industry publications as well. Those are three great areas that are easier to break into and are often looking to hear from new up-and-comers. They want to hear new stories, and it's a great place to connect. Knowing if your goals are realistic, um, establish, me like establish messaging for PR purposes. As I said, your messaging is different for PR than it is for marketing or advertising. So know what are your news messages that you're trying to get across. Monitoring Harrow's. I don't know if anyone's ever used Harrow's. It's a website called Help a Reporter Out that is developed where reporters can post people that they're looking for. So they might say, I'm looking to interview someone on this topic. So you can sign up, they send a daily email. It's something we monitor on a daily basis. And it's a great way to quickly engage with reporters. And I will say with Harrow's, the quicker you can respond to them, the better. So if you can respond within 10 minutes, your chances of actually getting a response back are tenfold, even though they'll say deadline is like two days later, but it is a reply quickly kind of thing. But that's a really great tool that anyone can sign up for, and it's very helpful. I'm tracking, tracking industry news and publications. You're gonna have a better chance of targeting the right people if you know what they're looking for. So read about your industry, know the type of reporters that you want to talk to. This is where I envision myself being one day. Read those publications, know those reporters, what are they interested in, so that you might know when you reach out to someone, this reporter seems particularly interested in an X area, and I can bring that to light when I email them or I contact them. So really know, the more you know about your industry, the better you're gonna know how to fit yourself into that picture and know what's new and relevant about your company and build your own media list. So I mentioned there's tons of ways to contact reporters. Some email addresses you might be able to find, some people you might be able to find by tweeting them, messaging them on LinkedIn, calling a news source and asking. So try to build your own media list, try to find as many targets as you can, and use relevant social media channels. So follow any reporters that you eventually would love to talk to you, Follow them on Twitter, engage with them, retweet them, try to get their your name in front of them so that they'll know who you are, hopefully, when you try to reach out to them. And Twitter is really a great place. Reporters are huge on Twitter. And while there are some reporters that have 100,000 contacts, those are very few and far between. Most reporters, I find, don't have average amount of Twitter users, maybe only a couple hundred and are tweeting their stories daily. So they're very active on Twitter, and they're gonna get far less tweets than they are emails, pitches. So it's a really easy way to ensure that a reporter actually sees your message. And I use it daily to try to get pitches and, and stories across. And um, go get coffee with Matt. Matt is our new business and marketing strategy tech guy for Ubiquity. And he always has an open invitation to anyone that wants to talk one-on-one -on -one about media strategy or PR. He's open to getting coffee and wants to build relationships with as many tech and entrepreneurs in town. So if anyone is interested, that is his email address and his phone number is also on the next slide. So that is everything from my end and I want to open it up to anyone who has questions, more information. <laughs> How does a PR firm charge money because advertising there's a fixed way of doing it in the industry mm -hmm. is it a different thing because you can't really you know how do you I mean, how do you charge a percentage or how does that work it varies somewhat most pr firms and at least the both that i've worked for work on a retainer basis we do do projects so it might be one flat fee for a three-month project around a product announcement and we would have we're going to write this press release we're going to generate three media hits and two thought leadership articles, and we charge over a three-month one-time rate. We 
her bigger clients are all on retainer, so they pay a, a monthly fee, and then we have certain goals that we meet per quarter. And that's very similar to the way my last year from charged as well. It was on a retainer. Questions? So are you doing your, um, there's some nice stuff written on, on Infusionsoft. So are you guys doing all their, um, you know, their blog posts or their, their, some of their software things? We don't do their blog posts. Um, they have their whole own PR and media team, so we really complement. So for bigger clients that have internal stuff, they write their own content, they generate, and they have get a lot of organic coverage as well. But a lot of their big stories we've generated, that's our main goal, is to generate news around announcements, big announcements that they do. They're a great company to work for. <laughs> because, well, sometimes, you know, some of their press releases were yeah. really, really technical. Mm -hmm. And all of our clients, and that's why our firm really specializes, because we want to make sure that we have that technical expertise in writing, and that's kind of one of our benefits as a firm, is that we have that ability to write very technical work. And we've written, I believe, all of their press releases for the last couple of years, with a couple of exceptions. And you find that the reporter's license came up with any technical? It really depends on the publication, and it depends who you're trying to target, because there are certainly very technical publications like Information Week or E Week, for example, that want that very technical language. And then if we, but when we send out a press release to a reporter, we write an email on top of that. So if it's a Tech Target or a um, Tech Crunch or something that's more consumerish, then we're gonna make sure that we explain it in our email in a way that is how they would write it. It's, it's easier to consume, it's here's why you would care about this, and then if we take it out to the more technical reporter, we're gonna wanna highlight these are the really technical aspects. So you really they just have to tailor everything to the publication, and it really depends on the reporter too, because some reporters will like that, some reporters will like one angle, and that's why I say it's so important to really read and know your industry, your publications, and the reporters, because everyone wants to see something different. So a press release is just, a press release obviously goes out to a huge mass audience, and it depends on what we're trying to accomplish, because sometimes we want that technical aspects in there because it, it reaches a certain audience, and then we do a lot that are not very technical. 